camera. I'm in Little Rock, Arkansas, in February of 1996, with a man who has given his life in service to his country and Jesus Christ, Colonel Jack Moore. Colonel Jack Moore is the man that I'm going to be interviewing, and I'm going to have him tell you his story. A story that's very interesting, a story that will help you to see the hand of God providentially moving in his life, where he was called into the service of the king in a most unusual way, at the hands of communist tortures and a Korean communist firing squad in Korea many years ago. At that time, Colonel Moore made a promise, and he did something that's kind of unusual when men make a promise to God. In his case, he kept it. And as far as I know, he's been keeping it for up to his 80 years of life now. And I've asked him to share the journey of his life from the time he made that promise and to tell the story that took place there in Korea. And also to tell you about a discovery that he made in his service to the king and for his country for these many years. Colonel Moore, I thank you for agreeing to this interview and of course, you and I sort of got together in 1984 when I had you come speak at my church. And uh, I might say to my viewing audience that my life was sort of turned upside down as a result of Colonel Moore coming to speak at our church. We had the ministerial alliance, the media, and the public wrath turned against us. And when I say turned upside down, I say that it was turned upside down for the better. And from that time forward, my eyes have been more open and God has certainly been leading as a result of Colonel Moore coming into my life. And I think that as he tells you the story that took place in his life, you can see the leading of God, and you'll probably make a discovery, as I did along the way, just as Colonel Jack Moore did, that will change your life. Colonel Moore, since we've only got one camera in the studio today, I'm going to ask you the question, just to ask you to tell the viewing audience the answer, but... I'd first of all like to start with sort of a biographical sketch of uh, Colonel Jack Moore up to the time of Korea. Mm -hmm. Well, I was, uh, I was raised up, I was the f first baby boy born in Chicago in 1916. In fact, for many years because of the fact that I was embarrassed to tell people that I was born at the Presbyterian Women's Hospital. I used to tell them I was born in Soldier's Field, which wasn't true, but and anyway, uh, I, I grew up in, as a small boy in, in central Michigan. I was an orphan. My mother and father were killed in an automobile accident when I was two years old. I was raised by a farm family in central Michigan until I got into my 20s. And uh, then I went to, uh, to Moody Bible Institute. I wanted to become a choir director. And I went there and, and studied the music under George Beverly Shea. Uh, who is quite well known in the in the fundamental uh, music uh, circles, and uh, and then in uh, uh, right after Pearl Harbor, I was in Chicago at the time working in the at the in the Pure Oil Building in in Chicago, and uh, when Pearl Harbor took place, and I was one of those fellows that went down all sorry-eyed with patriotism and signed up uh, the next day to uh, defeat. Uh, in this war that was uh, going to end all wars and that was going to save democracy. And uh, I went to uh, basic training in Fort Knox, Kentucky and and then down through uh, maneuvers in Louisiana and out into the desert and then went overseas with uh, George Patton's 2nd Armored Division to North Africa as a, as a buck sergeant. And uh, over there I won a battlefield commission at Kasserine Pass and uh, was wounded and spent most of the war years in the States, uh, most of them at uh, uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas. And uh, then in the end of the war, uh, had some combat duty in the South Pacific and uh, finally up into Japan on occupation duty. In fact, I was with the occupation ship that was on its, uh, or the occupation fleet that was on its way to Japan for what we thought was going to be the invasion of Japan when the two nuclear bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the war ended. I had a year and a half occupation duty in Japan where I learned to speak the language and then uh, came back to the States in the spring of 1946 and, and got a discharge and went up to North Dakota uh, where my wife's people were living at the time and uh, uh, took up ranching. 
I, uh, uh, I didn't have a very good, I didn't have much success as a rancher. I, the first year that I was up there, I put out 5,000 acres of wheat, one of the most beautiful crops that I'd ever seen. And 10 days before harvest, a hailstorm came through. And uh, when I harvested the crop, I think I cleared $56 profit for about the, one of the hardest summer's work that I'd ever put in. And then uh, that same spring, I had a tractor turn over on me and put me in the hospital for several months. And I was pretty much fed up with farming or ranching by the time that I, uh, by I finished there. And uh, then in the spring of 1948, I received a letter from the Department of Army and they said, we're looking for men that can speak Japanese, and we noticed from your record that you could, and uh, uh, we'd like to have you go back into active duty. We'll give you back your uh, rank of first lieutenant, and we'd like to have you go over to Korea as a member of the Korean Military Advisory Group to train the infant South Korean uh, uh, army that was just being built up at that time. So that's how you got to Korea, and obviously God had other plans for you as far as harvest goes. It wasn't going to be a harvest of wheat, mm -hmm. but uh, at that point in time, your Christianity, what was it, just nominal? I would, just, I would say that. I'm not, I, was, I, I wouldn't even be sure now looking back on it whether I was saved or not. I had one of these experiences that a lot of so-called Christians had. I'd gone forward to the church altar and, and uh, cried a few tears and signed a uh, read a little prayer that was handed to me on a card and uh, signed a commitment card and was baptized and joined the church, but I'd never been a very, what you'd call a dedicated Christian, I guess what you'd call a nominal Christian. I went to church when the Spirit led me. I uh, gave to the Christian causes when the Spirit led me, which wasn't very often, and uh, I didn't study my Bible very much. And I was one of those Christians that uh, when I did read my Bible and I came to a portion of it that I didn't understand, I went to my minister and asked him what it meant. I never took time to uh, go into it and dig into it myself and see what it really said. And so as a result, I came up with some, I didn't know it at the time, but later on found out some ideas that were rather twisted in my thinking. Well, God had a plan for you, and it started with a cr communist coup. Tell the story. Yeah, evidently he did. and. Uh, Sometimes it, it appears, my experience has been that uh, sometimes God has to knock people up alongside the head pretty hard to get them to listen. I was one of those extra hard-headed guys. I didn't learn very easy, and so I had to get smashed down and, and uh, knocked around and bloodied a little bit before I was willing to listen to what he wanted me to do. But in the fall of, uh, or I, when I got to Korea, I was sent down to the southwest section of Korea uh, to a little town called Yosu in the province of Chalonamdo. It was down on the, on, the, on the southwest corner of the Korean Peninsula. And uh, I was sent down there to work as an advisor with the 19th Infantry Regiment, which was uh, uh, the ship Sionde Regiment of the, of the uh, uh, South Korean Army. And uh, I was the only American down there for eight months uh, uh, living with uh, Korea, not knowing the Korean language very well, but speaking Japanese, I could get along with most of them pretty well. Most of them spoke Japanese because they'd been under Japanese occupation for 45 years and studied it in the school. So I was able to get along with them pretty well. But uh, it was a difficult job of taking farm boys that had never seen an electric light before. They'd never ridden in a motor vehicle of any kind and to try and turn them into modern soldiers with uh, uh, mechanical equipment. It was quite a difficult job. Uh, for instance, one, uh, one of the first examples that I saw was a young fellow that we brought in and he spent all one night standing at a light switch turning the lights on and off all night long until finally the sergeant <laughs> made him go to bed. He'd never seen electric light before. And it was difficult for us to comprehend that. We also ran into a very difficult situation in that most of the officers had been men that had fought in the Japanese army, and as a result, they had the Japanese idea of discipline. In other words, if a man did something that you didn't like, you hauled off and hit him up alongside the head of your rifle butt, or, and they were very brutal. And as a result of that, we had a great deal of, of difficulty in, uh, in uh, trying to get 
information across to the lower ranking men because many times the officers were the ones that stood in our way. What we didn't know at the time was that there was a very strong communist element that was operating within the Korean army. Evidently at the end of World War II there was a special school begun in Pyongyang uh, in North Korea, the capital of North Korea. Uh, this was in 1945 and it was uh, begun for young men from both North and South Korea where they were being trained to interfilter across the 38th parallel and get involved in the military apparatus of South Korea. Evidently their idea was that instead of having an invasion like they had in 1950, they were going to take over by a military coup. And uh, the, their plans evidently came to a head in the, uh, it was the 28th of November, 1948. Uh, I was not with my unit at the time. I was up at division headquarters, which is about 100 miles north of there. And uh, in my regiment of about 3,800 men, about 2,500 of them joined this rebellion that took place. It didn't break out nationwide because uh, something went wrong with their plans and it only broke out in five or six different places. But my regiment happened to be one of the ones where it really broke out seriously and about 2,500 out of the 3,800 men joined the uh, communist rebellion. Um, there were about 75 infiltrators, as near as we can figure. Uh, one night they, they went down and uh, uh, they killed off most of the loyal officers and then broke into the armory and we just had a shipment of a million uh, M1 Durand rifles that had come in from the states and or not a million, but 2,000 rifles and a million rounds of ammunition, and they took this over and then marched into the little city of uh, uh, Yosu, which was about five or six miles away, and uh, killed off the police department and set up our people's court and uh, uh, began a communist occupation of this area. They then marched up to the city of Sunchan, which was about 20 miles north of there, and Sunchan. Uh, the, the word Sunshine in Korean means peaceful heaven. Very, very lovely area. It was situated in, a, in the center of a large plain uh, surrounded by mountains on three sides. The southern uh, section of it was the, uh, uh, the Yalu Sea. These mountains were high enough that they had snow on them in the summertime. And it was a very, very fertile rice producing area. Also some of the most wonderful hunting in the world, especially bird hunting. You've never seen anything like it. And nothing at all to see a flock of 90 cock pheasants out in the rice paddy at one time. And uh, geese came in by the hundreds of thousands in the fall. That uh, I've been uh, hunting out here at Stuttgart, uh, Arkansas on occasion, which is one of the prime duck hunting areas here. Nothing like they had in Korea. Just amazing. And uh, it was also the Christian center of, uh, of South Korea. The, the Roman Catholic Church had had a mission station there for about 48 years. I think the Southern Presbyterians had been in there for about 45 years. And I think one of the reasons why they set up their headquarters in this uh, city was because of the Christian influence there, because they had the idea uh, and the follow-up from communism since that time has been that in order to control people, you must control the moral and the spiritual aspect. You've got to destroy the moral and spiritual aspect of people before you can control them and make slaves out of them. So they set up a, their regular communist apparatus there, which was a what they call a people's court. It's a very unusual. We don't have anything like it in, a, in this country or in the free world. It's made up of a judge, a prosecuting attorney, and the victim. If you happen to be a member of what they call the bourgeoisie, that's a property owner of any kind at all, you can be brought before this court. Uh, you don't have a defense counsel. You don't get a chance to speak in your own defense. Uh, they tell you about, uh, the prosecutor uh, tells about all the crimes that you've committed against the government, and then the judge pronounces sentence against you. Usually it's a death sentence, and the more brutal the execution is carried out, the better it is for their purposes because it scares people, you see. And so people are taken out and they're killed in, in the most brutal uh, ma um, uh, manner possible. And this in, in itself uh, begins to control people. Now, uh, to give you an idea of that, when, when this revolt broke out, 
I received word about 5 o'clock in the morning. I was about 100 miles away uh, at the uh, province capital of Quanzhou uh, when we heard about this. I wasn't very much upset by this revolt at first because uh, we had sort of known that there was going to be some problems uh, because at that time uh, a large number of the South Korean Army uh, personnel were jailbirds. Now, I'll qualify that by saying that uh, in those days, if a young man got in trouble with the law, the judge many times would tell him, you got a choice, either go into the army or we're going to put you in jail. So they joined the army, and they didn't like the police. Police were very, very brutal anyway, and, uh, and sort of a throwback to the old Japanese system. And so there was a constant fight between the, uh, the, the police and the, and, the, uh, and, and the Korean soldiers. And many, many times on a Monday morning, I'd have to take a truck and go into Yosu and bail out 40 or 50 of the boys that got thrown into jail over the weekend for fighting with the police. So when this thing broke out, uh, they were very, very uh, anxious and being uneducated boys and not knowing much about what was going on when these leaders said, well, look, we're going to take over control of the country. You go along with us and you're going to be the big shots in the government. That set pretty well with them. They sounded pretty good to them. So when I got down to Yosu, I took a company of, of infantry along with me, 100, about 185 five South Korean troops and we drove down about 90 miles down through the mountain roads and and got down there and found out instead of just a little thing it was a real full-grown uh, fight going on. The city of uh, Yosu or, or of Sunshine, uh, about 150 population, uh, was very easily defended because on the south side of the city there was a very a uh, fast-flowing deep river with only one bridge across it. So all you had to do is defend that bridge and you could pretty well defend the city from the invasion from the south. So I took my infantry company and put them in charge there and said, I don't want any of the Imingu and the, uh, the communists to come across this bridge. And then I went down to look for the police chief who was down in the center part of the city. I came back about an hour later and here the communists were coming across the bridge by droves. And I got a hold of the young lieutenant that was in charge, and I said, Chewy, lieutenant, uh, why are you letting the Imingun come across? And he said, oh, Morsan, he said, right after you left, uh, a man came across with a white flag, and he told us their plans and how they're going to take over the control of the country. And if we would join them, we would be the big shots in the new government. And we thought it was good, and so my company joined them. So that left me with about 45 policemen and they were down in the police station in the center part of the town and over there the police stations were sort of like medieval castles this one had a ten foot walls around it had turrets on the corners even had a moat around the outside with, with water in it somebody said they had alligators in i never saw any but anyway it was an old-fashioned type of a thing and the policemen had withdrawn into this fort i was under orders very strict orders at that time that i was not to get involved in any fighting they said, your job down there is an as observer, so don't get involved. Uh, keep out of the fighting and just let us know what's going on. So I went into the, uh, I went into the, uh, uh, the police station along with these men, and all during that afternoon and that evening, there was a fierce firefight went on. Our pl the policemen were armed with the old Arasika bolt-action rifle, which is sort of like our old O3 rifle and uh, used by the Japanese during World War II, and they would crank around into the chamber, stick the gun up over the wall, pull the trigger, come down again, and, and never stuck their head over the wall to aim or anything, and I don't think all day long we ever hit anybody on our side. I think we lost eight men on our side, and uh, I asked them, I said, why don't you stick your head over the wall to aim it? Oh, he said, we can't do that because they'll see us and shoot at us if we do that. So by the end of the afternoon, we were running short on ammunition. So uh, I hadn't had any sleep in over, over 24 hours, and I was leaning up against the wall fast asleep when one of the, one of the policemen came over and he said, Chewy, one of the Imingun wants to talk to you, one of the communists wants to talk to you. And so I looked over the wall, and here on the other side of the street, uh, sticking his head out around the corner with a white rag tied on his bayonet and waving it like that was this guy. He said, I want to talk to the Migu Komenkwan, the American advisor. I said, that's me. What do you want? Well, he said, we're going to storm the police station any minute now, and anybody that's in there, we're going to kill them. But if you want to come out, or any of the policemen want to come out, 
we'll promise you safe conduct. Well, when you get in a situation like that, immediately the wheels in your mind start going around at a rapid rate. How can I get out of this mess that I'm in? And so thinking back to my orders, don't get involved, nor being the fact that I'd worked with these guys and had been friends with many of them, I thought maybe I could talk them into uh, stopping what they were doing. So I came out with a tall policeman, if I remember, 12 or 13, I don't remember exactly, and uh, they didn't bother me at all. I was armed. I had a 45 pistol strapped on my waist, and uh, they were quite courteous. Some of them saluted, some of them shook hands with me. They were quite friendly. But as soon as we were outside of the, uh, where they couldn't fire at us from the wall, they grabbed these policemen, tied their hands behind them, and they don't tie your wrists, but they take your thumbs and wire them together with fine wire like picture wire, which is very, very effective. And then they uh, took them down in front of the courthouse where there was sort of a, well, there was four-lane traffic with a, like a flower bed down the center of it. They stripped these guys to the waist, forced them to lean in, uh, kneel down in the street, and then they executed them with bamboo spears. Now, for many, many years in the Orient, they didn't have firearms, and so when they wanted to hunt, uh, they'd uh, go out and cut down a, a bamboo, like a bamboo fishing pole, maybe an inch and a half, two inches in diameter, uh, sharpen a point on it, and uh, bamboo has the strange uh, uh, property that if you put it in the flame of a fire and turn it around very slowly, it hardens until it's like uh, steel, and the edges are just like the cutting edge of a sharp knife. And they executed these guys by just jabbing them in the chest and abdomen them until they were dead. Well, now while this was going on, I had noticed uh, activity going on in the courtroom, the courthouse, which was just down the street a little bit, and did some inquiring as to what was going on. They said, oh, they're setting up a people's court down there. I noticed out in front of that people's court, there was a bamboo pole, probably three inches in diameter and maybe five foot tall. It was set maybe, oh, maybe five foot off the ground. And uh, while we were wondering what that was for, uh, there was a commotion in the crowd and uh, four men came out dragging the police chief. He was a little short guy, maybe uh, five foot, four inches tall, weighed probably 185 pounds, a little guy by the name of Chung Sun Si. And they just picked that guy up and rammed him down onto that sharpened point to where it ran up into his body. And of course, he was screaming and hollering and making a real fuss. And while this was going on, they brought out his wife, who was a young girl, maybe 25 years of age, it looked like she was close to nine months pregnant, stripped her of her clothes, raped her over and over again, probably 15 or 20 times, and then literally chopped her up with her bayonets. Uh, as I said, I was under orders not to get involved, but sometimes you reach a point where you have to get involved. And when I saw them slice her breasts off with my, their bayonets, that was more than I could take, and I reached back for my pistol. I don't know now. It, have any idea what I was going to do, but uh, somebody knocked me over the head, and when I woke up, I was laying down in the prison cell down under the under the courthouse. Well, <clears throat> when you were there in the prison cell, uh, go ahead and tell the people, if you don't mind, and just speak into the camera, what you had to endure, because we are told today that communism is dead. Of course, we know that when we were told that news, that not all the communists died. Mm -hmm. And people in America still have a hard time understanding the brutality of that system. Well, uh, P Pete, the reason, uh, you don't mind me calling Pete, we're old friends, you know. <laughs> I don't but, mind at all. But uh, for, uh, it's difficult for the average American to understand a culture that has no that has not been softened by the Christian background. In America, uh, even people that have never been inside the doors of a church, the culture that they live just from having been in this country has softened them to a certain extent as far as their sentiments are concerned and their feelings are concerned. To normally, the normal person doesn't want to go out and hurt a child or, or a woman in particular, you see. But over there where you have no, none of this softening of the, of the culture at all, uh, the more brutal you are, it shows not only the fact that you're stronger than the other guy, but it also scares hell out of the people, and, and that's exactly what they want to have happen. So, and, tell about the brutality that they, they inflicted. Well, on you. Uh, 
I was laid in the prison cell there a couple of days, and then they took me up to the courthouse, which was a, it was a large room, I guess probably the size of maybe four basketball uh, floors. Uh, no chairs in it. It was packed with people, maybe 2,000 people in And up in the front, there was a, a big, heavy oak table uh, that was uh, uh, sitting there with a, an old-fashioned oak chair. Maybe you remember, I'm sure many of you remember the old-fashioned chairs with the big, heavy wooden arms and so on. And then at one end of the table, there was a little civilian man in a, uh, one of those high Mao Zedong jackets wearing one of those little skull caps, and he was sitting there uh, doing some writing. And I stood in front of the table for a few minutes, and finally I spoke to him in Korean, and I said, I'm an American officer, I want to uh, be turned loose. And he began to scream at me in Korean, how can a running dog of the capitalist, imperialist, Wall Street warmonger ask anything of a representative of the people? Sit down. And so I sat down in the chair. He came over, put his arm around me, and he said, we don't hate Americans, but everybody knows that you people are over here. You don't want to be over here, but you're over here because your government forces you to come over. And all we want you to do is cooperate with us and nothing, and we'll turn you loose. I said, what do you want me to do? Well, he brought out a parchment that was oh, maybe 18 inches long, and we're on uh, using the picturesque uh, language, of uh, Korean language, very similar to the Chinese characters. They had written 32 different things that America wanted to do to Korea. One of the laughable things I remember looking back on it, one of them was that we wanted to make a state out of Korea. Well, if you were in Korea at that time, all you had to do was smell the rice paddies and you knew that you wouldn't want to have that as a state. But this is one of the things that they had asked. I don't know why, thinking back on it, but uh, whether I shook my head, I don't remember shaking my head, I don't remember saying no, but all of a sudden the man behind me slapped me up against the side of the head, knocked me out of the chair, and he booted me a couple of times as I lay on the ground and then grabbed me and yanked me back up into the chair again. And then this little guy stood in front of me and I remember him shaking his finger in my face right at the end of my nose and screaming at me so loud that he was spitting all over me. And he said, you either do what I tell you to, you're going to wish you'd never been born. Well, you know, when you got two guys that are angry facing each other, that can be a volatile situation. And as I said, he was so angry he was spitting all over me and I didn't like what had happened to me, and I made a bad mistake, and I spit back at him, and I shouldn't have done that, because he was in the driver's seat. And he barked an order in Korea, and then before I could stop him, they grabbed me. Uh, four or five men jumped on me and stripped me of every stitch of clothes I had, including my socks, and tied me down in that chair, wired me in with wire to where I couldn't move, and then they brought over a long wire with a clamp on the end of it, hooked it up to one of my nipples and then tied the other end around my penis and then played a little game of asking questions and turning on a switch of electricity. I can't remember the pain. Looking back on it, I don't remember the pain. It was just like a giant forest picking me in that chair up in the air and then when the electricity come on, smashing us into the ground. Just a terrific shot. And it seemed like it went on all afternoon. I'm sure it was only a few seconds and I passed out and when I came to, I was laying back in that prison cell. Now, I, was, I said I was a boy that was a nominal Christian. I hadn't gone to church in a long time. I hadn't read my Bible, hadn't prayed, I hadn't been living a Christian life anyway at all. When I began doing some high, high and heavy praying, I'll tell you, when I was there, I began to remember some things that I'd been taught as a, a boy in church and Sunday school and so on. And it seemed like the more I prayed, the, it seemed like my prayers were hitting that ceiling up above me and bouncing right back down on me. The more I prayed, the more frustrated I got. One day I was kneeling in the straw when a guy turned on the light. It was complete darkness. You couldn't see a thing. All you could do was hear the rats running around in the straw. And one of the guys came in and found me kneeling in the straw and he said, oh, you're a Christian, are you? What are you praying to your God for? He can't do anything for you. Why don't you pray to me? And he hit me up alongside the head, knocked me down on the ground and then beat me insensible as I lay on the ground. This went on for a number of days, and uh, uh, finally, I guess maybe the 10th or 12th day, I can't remember for sure, they, they, oh, they came in and played little games with me, like tying me up by my heels from a, a beam where I could just touch the floor with the tips of my fingers, and then beating on my, on my back and on my, the, the distended muscles with uh, 
thin uh, steel rods about as big as your finger, like sort of that were flexible like a fish rod. And just a, uh, I can't explain the sensation uh, of pain that is caused by that sort of thing on distended muscles. And other little games that they played that, that I, I don't want to go into right now. Did they not take you also out in the public square and tie you up for them to throw Yeah, the yes, out? they did. One of those days, they took me out and they, they, uh, they took a, a steel needle about that long with a leather thong on it and ran it down through under the nipple of my right breast and tied me up to a pole. And I, my hands tied behind me and I was still stripped completely naked and just left me there. And the little kids had a field day throwing uh, vegetables at me and horse manure and the women had come up and poke me and make vulgar remarks about me and this sort of thing. And uh, I stayed there, uh, I stood up I guess, several, I don't know how many hours that day in the hot sun and, until I finally passed out and, and snapped the cord and, as I fell down and they hauled me back to the prison cell. A couple of days later they took me up to be sentenced and I remember as I came in the back of the room, uh, now I had I'd done some heavy praying. I said, the, uh, I, I, for the first time in my life I got down to nitty gritty with God. And I knew what I was doing. I didn't know what I was doing that time when I'd gone forward five or six different times in a church altar, but I knew what I was doing there. And I said, God, I'm not going to get out of this mess unless you help me. And I promise you that if you get me out of this mess and get me back with the people I love and the uh, country that I love, I'll do everything in my power to see that what I saw happen in this area here will never come to our people. That's the driving force in my life today. And uh, they took me up to the court for sentencing. Sometime during the night, Somebody had brought in an old raggedy pair of pants and they'd thrown them in and I was able to get into those. And they took me in and I remember as I came in, uh, there were double doors, swinging doors in the back and standing up against the wall was a, a Korean sergeant by the name of Yoo Chung Nam. We called him Paksa, which means uh, professor in Korean. He was a high school history teacher in civilian life. He'd been a friend of mine and he spoke pretty good English. He had gone to the Presbyterian school and uh, I said, Pox, oh, for God's sakes, help me. And he just lashed out, hit me with the back of his hand across the mouth and to where he started my nose bleeding and screamed at me in Korean, Prabhu Michange, Chita Honda. As close as I can translate it is, you stupid crazy dog drop dead from a heart attack. And went stomping up to the front of the room, screaming and hollering about how he hated all Americans, how I was the worst one he'd ever known. And, all the bad things I'd done against the Korean people and he said I'd like to take this American bastard out and shoot him. And he created enough of a of a uh, impression I guess on the civilian judge that he gave him permission and Pak Chan went out and was gone maybe 10 minutes and came back with eight men with rifles and they took me out of the courthouse. As we went out he whispered something to me rather strange. He said uh, more son when the rifles fire fall down dead. Well, I didn't know what he meant, but that's usually the thing that happens when they're aimed at you and the, somebody pulls you know, the trigger. Normally in a firing squad, you don't have to be told to fall no, down No, that's yet. right. But uh, they took me down a little old cobblestone road, about eight blocks away, I guess, and they drove away some of the curious onlookers that wanted to go along with them. I remember standing in front of this stone wall, and I was clenching my fists and gritting my teeth because I knew I'd had it. And I can remember just as clearly as if it was yesterday that the man, as he gave the orders in Korean for the guns to, to be, the rifles to be raised, I heard him give the command to fire and I heard the guns go off and I was still alive. So I figured they must have shot over my head. So I fell down like I'd been hit. And he came up and bent over me like he was checking me out. And he, he said to, in a low voice where nobody could hear, he said, more son, as soon as we're gone and the coast is clear, go up to the Moksa's house. Go up to the missionary's house on Masan Hill and I'll try and smuggle you out of the city if I get a chance. And he stood up and spit on me and cursed me out and kicked me in the ribs and marched off with his men. And uh, when the coast was clear, I was able to uh, drag myself up to the missionary's house and uh, where I stayed until the, until the government troops came in about 10 days later. During that period of time, I was in a position where I could see some of the atrocities that are committed in a communist country. 
For instance, we were on the only hill in the city, which was like a little chocolate drop in the center of the city, and the mission station looked down into the courtyard of the mission school section, the girls section over here. During those 10 days, I counted 47 little girls between the ages, I would say, 12 and 15, that were dragged out into the courtyard, stripped and raped, and beaten to death or bayoneted to death, 47 of them. Saw a number of occasions of young women being, with babies in their arms, being chased by soldiers. I remember one that I guess I'll never forget of a small, um, a baby, a mother with a small baby, maybe uh, just a few weeks old, being chased by two drunken soldiers, and they caught her, took the baby away from her, and then stood maybe 10 feet apart and played a little game of tossing the baby back and forth and catching it on the points of their bayonets. And when one of them began to scream and holler, or when she began to scream and holler, one of them reversed the butt of his rifle and knocked her to the ground and beat her to death as she lay on the ground. Uh, the mission station or the, the Catholic church was just across the street, and uh, they nailed two nuns up against the wall of the church by driving bayonets through the palms of their hands and then under their rib cage here where it didn't kill them. And they screamed and hollered up against the wall of that church for eight or ten hours before they passed out. I was in the window of the mission station with a rifle in my hands, praying to God whether I ought to shoot those uh, women to put them out of their misery, and I was afraid to do anything because we had seven American women in the mission station. We were afraid they'd come up and, and do the same thing to them. And then on the last day before the government troops came in, they, uh, they brought out a young girl, probably 20 years of age, a real beautiful girl, stripped her of her clothes, nailed her to a branch of a tree with spikes like that driven through her bare breast and left her hanging there and then took a, a bundle of rice straw that had been dipped in oil and bound it between her bare thighs and set on fire. And I tell you, Pete, when I saw that, I, 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 I come close to cracking up, I'll tell you. And I re resolved that if God helped me, if I ever got back here, I was going to fight this thing if it, meant, if it meant my life. I was going to fight this thing with everything I've had. And I'm like the Datsun people now. I am driven. <laughs> people wonder sometimes. They said, oh, you're a radical. You're a, you're, you're a kook. I said, I may be a radical and I'm a kook, but I've got a reason for being radical, I tell you, because I've seen it and gone through it. And then uh, a, a, I was given the opportunity then, to, uh, when the government troops came in, they said, you can either go back to, you can either go to Japan or you can go back to the States, take your pick. And I realized that if I left that area, I'd always have in the back of my mind the fear of this thing that I'd seen. And so I made one of the hardest decisions I'd ever made, and I asked them to send me back to the area where I'd been captured. And so I went back there and spent uh, nine months in that area. It was actually a combat area because uh, these rebels had scattered and gone into the hills, and they were being supplied by an underground coming from North Korea. And uh, for nine months, we had, a, during 1949, we had over 500 casualties in the regiment. I was shot at three different times in roadblocks, and uh, so this, led, this was the thing that led up to the, to the beginning of the Korean War then. I not wanted to interrupt you. I want to just have you tell the story just like you're telling it. We haven't even got to your work back in the States, but mm. I want to, before we get to you coming back to the States, I want you to go ahead and tell the story of the Korean War itself. Now, you're one of the most highly decorated men that come out of the Korean War, isn't that correct? Well, I, I left the, the area uh, after about nine months uh, in the early part of 1950. I was transferred up to Seoul and was uh, made advisor of a infantry battalion that was at a little town called Pochan, which was about 18 miles north of Seoul on one of the major invasion routes into the, into the uh, city. Now what I want you to tell as you tell this story, uh, Colonel Moore, is what you told me privately several years ago about some of the treason that you witnessed yeah. coming from the State Department. Yeah, this I'm, 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 trying, to, I'm okay. trying to lead into that. Yeah. Good. Just go now, right on. The, uh, when the war broke out, they immediately began evacuating. Well, my, my unit was overrun. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, for six months before the war began, uh, we had turned in reports. By we, I'm talking now about the advisors of the units along the 38th parallel. 
had been turning in reports of North Korean buildup. We were at that time under the State Department and we had to report to a State Department colonel. And uh, many, many times uh, I would have this guy actually sneeringly say to me, you guys see a communist under every rock and behind every bush. And I remember one day that uh, uh, I got a little angry and I said, if you'd get up off your big ass and go up there where the action was, you'd see them too. Well, the lieutenant doesn't say that to a bird colonel, so I got in trouble with it. But anyway, we, uh, the night before, uh, the day before the war began, and my unit, which we had about, I guess, about 850 men, the enemy moved in and a regiment uh, or an infantry division of about 11,000. There had been one company of infantry there. They moved in an infantry division. They moved in a regiment of mounted horse cavalry, about 1,800 of them, and they moved in 76 tanks. We'd never seen a heavy tank in that area before. Now, I was under orders that to report to this bird colonel any time, no matter when, when I saw something that I thought he ought to know. So when I got back to Seoul that night, it was sort of late, I checked the colonel and he was having a party with some big shots from Tokyo at the officers club. So I went, broke in on his party. I was filthy dirty. I'd just driven 30 dusty miles and a hard day out in the field. And he didn't appreciate me at all, but I broke in to tell him what, and he got very angry with me and ordered me out of the place. And then at 4 o'clock the next morning, I get a telephone call from his unit. You better get up with your unit. They're coming across all on the 38th parallel. Oh, I forgot. I, I got ahead of myself a little bit. In a briefing that morning, this man stood up and said, there's no sign of any enemy activity. Go to the party tonight if you want to. And as a result of that, there were not any more than 15% of the advisors who were in a condition to be with their men when the fighting broke out. I had had a, a little scrap with my wife the night before and we didn't go to the party, otherwise I might have been with them too. But anyway, when this party broke out the next morning, and I got up there to find my unit under heavy, heavy attack. We didn't have any artillery support of any kind. And uh, I got my, uh, the first decoration of the war that morning by trying to, to stop two enemy tanks with a, a small anti-tank gun that just, the shells just bounced off the, uh, the tank and didn't do any good at all. But they began evacuating the, uh, the people. In fact, I got back, I had to walk back uh, 38 miles to Seoul because my Jeep had been destroyed by a tank. And I got there just in time to kiss my wife goodbye as they were hauling her off to, to put them on a Norwegian fertilizer ship down in Incheon, the, the women and children, to take them back to Japan. I was on the last plane load that was to leave from Japan and before we could leave, I think there were 15 of us, and before we got a chance to leave, one, a fighter plane landed and said, we've just received word from MacArthur's headquarters that Truman is sending in the Navy and the Air Force, so you're to stay here and go back and s to headquarters and see if you can do anything to help them. So uh, we went back to headquarters and uh, uh, that first night, and then the next day, they had evacuated, evacuated everybody except in the, uh, all the civilians with the exception of the ambassador, William Bu uh, Musio, and two of his flunkies were still there. On the outskirts of Seoul at that time, there was an, a gasoline dump that had just come in from the States a couple of weeks before. There was a million 40-gallon barrels of gasoline. And we didn't want the North Koreans to get that, and they were already breaking through our defenses on the north side of the city. So I went down to the ambassador's office with a major from Bismarck, North Dakota, fellow by the name of Paul, uh, Paul, uh, uh, that doesn't matter, and I can't remember his last name right now. But we went down there to get permission to burn it. And the ambassador literally cursed us out of his office. He said, I'm sick and tired of you military trying to tell me how to run this war. Get out of here, I'll, I'll tell you when to burn it. And as a result of that, four hours later, the North Koreans had 40 million gallons of gasoline from America, enough to run their tanks for four months. What was the name of that ambassador? Mm -hmm. Do you remember the name of that ambassador? 
The name of the what? Of the ambassador. Yeah, William C. Musio, M-U-C-C-I-O. He left uh, the next day for Japan, and uh, my commanding officer told Major, oh, Major Hedstrom, Paul Hedstrom, told Major Hedstrom and I, I want you to go down to the embassy building and go through it room by room to make sure they didn't leave any reports behind. So we were going through the building. It was a five-story building, and we were going through it, and on the ambassador's office, we found a locked door in the back, and they kicked that in, and in there was an old-fashioned military safe. I'm sure that many of you that have been in the military remember it was uh, made up of steel filing cabinets with a, an iron rod run down through the handles and a padlock on the top. We shot off the padlock, and in there we found the reports from the MAG headquarters of enemy buildup along the 38th parallel for the preceding six months that had never been forwarded to MacArthur's intelligence headquarters in Tokyo. He was uh, Lieutenant General, uh, not Stratemeyer, but uh, Wiedemeyer. So uh, these reports had never got to him. And when the war began, they crucified him in the media because he didn't know what was happening. The reason he didn't know was because the State Department had deliberately withheld reports. So I picked out four of the most incriminating ones, and I stuck them in my pocket. Major Hedstrom said, what are you going to do with them? I said, I'm going to get them back to the States. He said, they'll hang you if they catch you doing it. I said, I don't care. The people need to know about this. And so a couple of days later, I was able to get these into the hands of a young officer who was headed back to the States, and he hand-carried them to Washington, where he gave them to Senator Bill uh, Nolan from California, who at that time was a member of the Armed Forces Committee. Senator Nolan told me later on that when he took those reports before the Senate Armed Forces Committee and tried to read them, that they laughed him off the floor of the Senate saying no American ambassador would do anything like that. Don't talk about it. And he said when I insisted that they do something about it, they began a campaign that finally ran me out of the Senate. This is just one thing. Now, you, when you see things happening like that, you do what we sometimes call Monday morning quarterbacking. You know, you watch the ball game on Saturday, and then Monday morning you say, now if the quarterback would have passed that time instead of run with the ball, we might have had a touchdown. <coughs> Not very long before the, war, uh, before the war began, there was a bird colonel by the name of William Baird. He had 36 years of service. He was probably the most powerful military man, American military man in Korea, because he was the advisor of the, of the South Korean National Police, which had more men in it than the Army had at that time. He had a very beautiful secretary, I can't remember her name now, a Korean girl who was, had been a professional model. She had worked for him for about three years. And uh, when the war, uh, uh, we didn't know at that time, but she was the wife of the number two military man in North Korea. For three years, she was using American military police vehicles to take information from Seoul to a little town of Quezon on the 38th parallel where her mother lived, and then her mother would get it across the parallel to her husband. Not only that, but she was shacking up with eight of the top State Department men and had got over two million dollars in State Department funds that she funneled into North Korea. And when the war began, the Korean police took her out and shot her without a trial. But in the meantime, Colonel Baird had been on a ship headed for the States. They arrested him in, in uh, uh, Oakland when he got there and put him under arrest to quarters pending whether they were going to court martial him or not. He had a dossier on every one of those people, including the ambassador and these eight men in the State Department, had so much dirt on them that they swept everything under the carpet. Musio was sent to Iceland as the ambassador to Iceland. These eight men involved with this girl were all promoted in the State Department, and nothing was said about it in the media. I guess about eight years later, there was a little scandal sheet called pageants. You'll maybe remember it. It was sort of a format like the Reader's Digest, but more or less of a scandal type of sheet. They had an article in it. That was the only time that the media ever talked about it. And then I began to think, look here, this is just one little old lieutenant seeing this. What's the big picture that's going on all over, you see, in the country with this sort of thing going on? And that was the first time that I actually began to realize the treason that was 
uh, that was that was ha happening within our own uh, State Department and on our military. And since that time, during my military career, I run into ever several other things. My problem was that I always had a big mouth. I guess I got that from George Patton because George Patton was that way. When he saw something he didn't like, he said it, and he always got in hot water over it. And I did the same way, and I got in hot water over it every time. But you know, it, this is a little bit off the subject, but I guess. Uh, be worth putting here. You told me one time that uh, you had the privilege of getting personally chewed out by George Patton. Oh, yes. When, uh, just after I had gotten my commission, uh, George uh, had probably the sharpest eye of any man that I'd ever seen. I had read somewhere that uh, if you were to take nail polish, polish your brass and put nail polish on it, you'd never have to polish it again. And so I polished up my second lieutenant bars and put some nail polish on it, and I was walking down the street when I ran into General Patton. I gave him a high ball and walked on by him, and I guess I'd gone by about 10 feet when I heard this. He had a real high-pitched feminine voice. He said, Lieutenant! And I turned around and went back and stood at rigid attention in front of me, and he said, if you want to know why the damned army is having so trouble and why the country's going to hell, it's because the damned officers are so damn lazy that they won't even take time to polish their brass anymore. And for about 15 minutes, he went over my ancestry from beginning to end, I mean, until I fell. If there had been a crack in the sidewalk, I could have fell right through it. But well, that was the first face-to-face -face confrontation that I had with George Patton. I wanted to put it in here because mm. you're sharing history, and that was a mm. that was a historical moment in your life. Mm -hmm. Shoot out by George Patton. Now you got a uh, what battlefield commissions to colonel in the war, the yeah. Korean War, and not in the Korean War, no, during World War II. During from, World War II. Yeah, from General Patton. But uh, well, now when did uh, you advance to colonel? Were you colonel you, in Korea? You when? when did you become a colonel? Oh. Uh, 1963. 1963, I worked my way up to the lieutenant colonel. Well, back in Korea then, uh, of course, you spent the entire war in combat, did you not? Well, I was, uh, I was in front line uh, consec 278 consecutive days of front line duty in the beginning of the war, uh, from um, just a few days after the war began until the spring of 19... Uh, of 1951, I was on the front line, never without any break at all. And uh, uh, I, in addition to the silver star that I got on the first day, I had four bronze stars with the uh, VD Vice, uh, or bronze star, and four uh, uh, clusters, which is the same, at four purple hearts, at uh, two uh, unit uh, commendations, and uh, uh, two pre or two presidential citations and then I had a uh, uh, citation from the Czechoslovakian government and from the uh, uh, Polish government in exile. So I came out one of the one of the top ten decorated men in the army. I don't know overall what it was but... Well Colonel Moore we've taken it from the time of your birth up through the end of World War of uh, the Korean War and God allowed you to see firsthand things that most Americans can't even visualize. And then your life goes from there. You try to get the message back to America for the rest of your life. Mm. And what I want to do on the next video is, uh, is to take it up from the time that you came back to the States, how you received Bible training, mm. how you started lecturing for the John Birch Society, and how you started making discoveries in Scripture, similar discoveries that I've made. Well, Pete, I realized at that time that evidently God must have had something planned for me because there were at least five occasions during the Korean War when I was should have been blown to bits and I never got anything more than just a few scratches. And, uh, uh, for instance, in the early part of the war, the, uh, uh, the second day of the war, we had no supplies, and so I had gone across the river into the town of Yongdong Po and it filled my Jeep. The, the American houses, the refrigerators were still going, and we just went in and helped ourselves to the food. Packed the back of the Jeep, and then as a afterthought, I threw a mattress on the top of it, because I didn't have anything to sleep on. 
And as we got up on the highway, there had been one uh, 120 two millimeter cannon that had been shooting at us from North Korea. It had been dropping shells all over the area, none of them close to us. But we just got up on the highway and I was there with my uh, interpreter. When we heard the gun fire again and immediately I realized that he'd changed aim and it was gonna come pretty close to us. And about that time a shell come whistling in and it hit the spare tire and the Jeep. Blew the whole rear end of the Jeep off, both wheels blew off. And I was hit 97 times from my waist up to the back of, under my helmet. And uh, very few of them, a couple of places under my helmet that broke the skin. Didn't break the skin, but the shrapnel went through that mattress and it was wrapped in cotton batten. And it looked like somebody had pounded me on the back with a board. I was black and blue, but I didn't have any broken skin. And there were Amazing. a number of times... Uh, and then just before MacArthur came over on his first trip, uh, I followed his convoy up, and we were strafed by four of our own planes by a mistake. I was with a convoy of South Korean trucks. And uh, one of the F-80s came in from behind me, and uh, came from behind me before I could get out, stop or get out. And uh, the Jeep had 2750 caliber bullet holes in it. A shell came in over either either shoulder, clipped the steering wheel out above my hands and never touched me. So uh, I began to get the idea that maybe somewhere along the line God wanted me to do something. And you say you had five close calls like that. Five close calls like that. You want that. to share the others? Because this is history and someday people are going to be watching Jack Moore tell the story. Well, uh, for instance, one day we were observing uh, artillery fire, our own artillery fire. This was after we had gone across the 38th parallel and were in North Korea. We were observing artillery fire and I had on, it was a winter time, and I had on a, one of those Korean uh, hats with the, uh, fur hats with the helmet. It was warm enough that I had the ear flaps up and I was down behind a hedge with the field glasses observing when a sniper up on the hill, probably a thousand yards away, with a 12, a 12 millimeter uh, sniper rifle, which is, that's about a 56 caliber, fired around. It came through one flap of my, of my hat here and across the top, tore the top out of the hat, threw the other flap and threw my hat 50 foot away and never touched me. <laughs> you begin to think a little bit, you know, when something like that happened. Another day we were out in the schoolyard. Uh, there were four of us talking and we were, we were, uh, about like this group right here. A 120 millimeter mortar round dropped right in front of us. Knocked us all down. Not a one of us got a scratch and a Korean soldier 75 yards away was killed by the shrapnel. Amazing stories. It's amazing, isn't it? So things, things like this, a number of times it happened like that. that it was, uh, did it ever make you remember your promise to God? Yes, it sure did. And, um, Sometimes when I got back to the, to the States, right at first, I didn't particularly want to fulfill that uh, promise. I had to get smacked up alongside the head with a tube for a couple of times before I really began to, to do that. But, uh, well, Colonel Moore, let's uh, break now. Uh, I really appreciate you sharing with posterity mm -hmm. these stories. But the next video, we're going to talk about Colonel Moore coming back to the United States trying to tell the American people what he had witnessed, and he will then tell us also about the discovery he made along the way, the tie-in of communism to a religious sect, if you will, if you want to call it that, and the discovery about the people who settled the United States of America. So that's going to be in the next video. Colonel Moore, thanks very much. For Thank you, Pete.